Um, thank you for coming. I'm Christina Roberts. I am the cantor at Our Savior Lutheran Church and School in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, the title of this workshop, because you've now confirmed it for me, is Developing and Utilizing a Children's Core Hymnody, or current leader is the German word for that. So I think here. Um, and it's pretty much the same title of a presentation that I gave a handful of years ago, um, but the content the premise is the same, the content is different, but this is why you are a very different audience in that first group that I gave this presentation for. Uh, the first group was um, uh, mostly reluctant teachers and pastors who were maybe interested in teaching kids to sing hymns, but not con totally convinced. And so my focus at that one was really <coughs> trying to convince them that, um, that to develop a culture of hymns and of children singing you should utilize a small number of very carefully chosen hymns. But I'm pretty confident that we are all on the same page. We're going to teach our children to sing. We're going to teach our children to sing hymns. Um, this is what we're doing. You know, I'm preaching now to the choir directors. So I don't have to convince you of this. But my premise remains the same. It is a carefully refined, intentionally chosen, and used collection of just a few hymns that are going to serve our children the best. Consider what C.F.W. Walther said when reviewing a new hymn book. Uh, when one is in the habit of looking to certain hymns for a particular doctrine of occasion, and then finding made-to-order songs of little poetic value, it happens that due to the sheer quantity of hymns, that the familiarity of Christians with their very best hymns becomes less. So today I, and Walter, might be asking you to consider doing something a little uncomfortable. We might need to begin teaching fewer hymns. Um, now, if you know me, this might come off sounding also hypocritical, because if you have followed me on social media, might know that I am the cantor who took her entire church and school through a hymn marathon. We sang all of the hymns in LSB. We started on a cold morning in January of 2021 with uh, 331, the Advent for King, and we sang at least one stanza of every hymn in the hymnal until we got to 966 before you Lord we bow which was about 12 hours later, and we had enlisted the help of people across the country who sent in videos of hymns to kind of give us little breaks um, and things like that. But we did it the whole day. So how do I justify the act of singing every hymn in the hymn book, which contradicts my thesis of focusing on this small number of hymns? Well, because that hymn marathon, which played a really important role in the lives of the children and of the church, when many things have been taken away from us during that time of COVID, could never have taken place had we not spent a good portion of two decades building a really strong core hymnody. It's because we have so intentionally used and taught the small percentage of hymns that our children now have access to pretty much any hymnody that we put in front of them. Um, I do have a handout of what those hymns are and what we use and how we um, are, use them, but I'm intentionally withholding that from you for a while um, because before we dig into the hymns, which hymns make the cut, which hymns don't, um, I think it's important to look at what I consider to be the top three benefits of operating off of a current leader for our children. Uh, first and foremost, like the small catechism, a core hymnody will give young Christians access to concise doctrine. A doctrine that strengthens their faith through the work of the Holy Spirit. And because that doctrine is paired with music, it becomes easily and joyfully internalized. When we sing the word of God, whether we're in the divine service or in the shower, whether we're singing to keep ourselves awake while we're on a long road trip, or we're in the middle of the night singing to help our child or maybe even ourselves to fall asleep, the Holy Spirit is at work. A hymn learned by heart is going to provide the Christian quicker, more applicable access to the Word of God than a hotel full of Gideon's Bibles. And singing brings joy. When you sing truth, you're uniting truth and
and joy. And there's nothing stronger than a joyful truth. You can have a burdensome truth, and you can have a false joy, although I would argue that's probably a different emotion other than joy. Um, but when the word of life is wed to the confidence and pleasure, the whole body incarnational experience of singing, you have a bond that is not easily broken. A core hymnody has the musical and doctrinal tenacity to serve a Christian for their whole life through. Um, it's very popular these days to ask people for their Mount Rushmore list. If you've heard this, right? People ask you for your, like, what's your Mount Rushmore, you know, pizza toppings, or what's your Mount Rushmore vacation spots? Basically, it's just a new way of asking what are your top four favorite things. Um, but I prefer sort of the older desert island, what four things would you take to a desert island way of thinking about our core hymnody when you want to ask this question. Um, so if you were stranded on a desert island, what hymns would you wish to have? What hymns could sustain your confidence in the saving work of Christ when faced with nothing but sand and salt water and seagulls, essentially with imminent death? What hymns can you bring to mind and to ear when all has been taken from you? And there's no LSB arriving in a glass bottle, no data to access hindu.org really quickly. These desert island hymns, these are our core hymns. Now, they may not necessarily be your favorites, although I'd argue that by necessity of life, they become those favorites often. And like the small catechism, it's not just that these hymns are pedagogical. They don't simply instruct us in the faith, although they do do that. But the Holy Spirit uses them to keep us in that faith, to nourish us with his word, to comfort us with his promises, and to point us to Jesus. So what are my Desert Highland lists? My Mount Rushmore. Uh, dear Christians, one and all rejoice. O morning star, how fair and bright. Christ Jesus lay in death strong bands. Um, and when in the hour of deepest need, although I'm I will admit that that's probably Teddy Roosevelt from Mount Rushmore, right? I mean, that's the one that I was like, I think it belongs on this list, but I'm not totally sure. Um, but it's there right there. But don't panic, because the core list that I use with their children is longer than four hymns. But those four might be a good place to start when we have to actually pare down the list of what we've been using and focus our children's attention to build strong habits of intentional the second benefit of utilizing a core hymnody is that it actually makes the children more adept at picking up all of hymnody. This is what I alluded to when I mentioned our hymn marathon earlier. When our children sing the best of Lutheran hymnody over and over again, it gives them both the musical and textual vocabulary to very quickly learn and perform additional hymns. This is where the analogy of doing sit-ups comes in. If you regularly do crunches and sit-ups and other ab exercises, you're going to strengthen your core muscles. And when your abdominal muscles, when that core is strong, everything else in life becomes easier. Getting in and out of a car is easier. Walking up and down a flight of ste steps is easier. Picking up a laundry basket is easier. Even playing a really tricky pedal line on the organ is easier if your core muscles are there. Everything becomes easier if our core is strong, and the same is true for our hymns. If our knowledge of the core hymnody and faith is strong, we know how to work the muscles of melody, rhythm, harmonic structure, theological vocabulary, and poetic form, the aspects that make up all hymnody, then a new hymn is a challenge we're prepared for. Um, early last spring, as the news was saturated with war and violence, I decided what we as a church and school needed was to learn and to diligently pray Luther's brief hymn, Grant Peace We Pray and Mercy Lord. It's LSB 778. Uh, not the Mendelssohn, but the, the one we did, the Luther one that we was at the end of the year last night. Um, I introduced it to each of our classes at school, K through H, by singing it to them. And then asking them to simply listen to the melody while I sang it. I was actually, and then I was going to ask them what they heard after I was done singing it. 
What I was actually expecting was for them to hear a little melodic interval that we've been working on in some of our ear training, but that's not what happened. What happened was so much better. Almost before I was done singing, hands in the air, just crazed, ready to tell me what they had heard. Um, and without exception, every class, remember, kindergarten through eighth grade answered the same exact way. What did you hear? That sounds just like Lord Keep Us Steadfast in Your Word. Oh, 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 yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. But then across the room, there's other kids going, no, 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 no. I heard Savior of the Nations come. They're all right. They're all completely correct, right? All three hymns by Martin Luther, which was you know something they instantly also picked up on because they know that Lord Keep Us Steadfast and Savior of the Nations are both by Luther, and they'd already zoned down to the bottom of the page to find out. Um, they knew, they knew this is it, but they knew they sounded alike because they're all built on the same ancient modal framework. And because Lord keep us steadfast and Savior of the nations come are part of our core hymnody, they could not only identify the connection, but then they learned the new hymn, Grant Peace We Pray, in just a matter of minutes. It was just, it's there, it was part of their vocabulary already. Um, the final benefit of using a core hymnody, or at least the final one we're going to talk about today, is that it makes our children more discerning. The hymns of the core hymnody become the hymns by which every other hymn is judged. Um, the students at Our Savior have some strong opinions. This is probably my fault, but I do not even <laughs> care. <laughs> uh, they do not suffer foolish hymns lightly. Not only can they spot bad theology because of their rich knowledge of hymnic doctrine, but it makes them incredibly quick in identifying hymns that offer very little theological depth. And I, this is a much more difficult task. I mean, it's not too hard to find a mistake in theology. We all like to you know, look for heresy and point it out. But I'm not talking about heresy. I'm talking about hymns that are more empty and vacuous. And they spot things. I think this is a greater danger for us. We're not likely to find heresies in our hymnals, right? I mean, we're just not but, or even in the choral music that we present to them. But finding something that's empty and vacuous, this is, the kids are tuned in. Um, children who expect their hymns to be chock full of the saving work of Christ have very little patience for weak community. Um, this typically manifests itself by uh, young students attempting to sort of read their deeper understanding of theology of faith um, into a hymn, and then becoming kind of incredulous when they find out that the hymn text writer didn't actually mean that. Like, for example, every year, somebody really, 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 really wants the lowing cattle in the way in a manger to be pointing to the sacrificial system, right? And, okay, I'm pretty gentle about bursting their bubbles about these things, because I think when they point out those kind of depths that probably the text writer did not intend at all, what they're really doing is they're viewing these hymns under the guise of the eighth commandment. They're putting the best construction possible on them. But they're, they're looking for this depth in every single hymn we sing, because it's what they expect. Um, this discernment applies not only to the theological content of the hymns, but also to the musical and poetic aspects. A bad rhyme will not be tolerated. They have no use for trite rhyming. Um, a trite tune will make its way in and then right back out of favor very quickly. Odd word choices, overly produced arrangements can grab their attention, but they don't hold it for very long because these things do not have the staying power that the children have come to expect in their humility. Our children will be deluged with music throughout their lives, and having that sort of gold standard by which to judge doesn't mean that they won't participate in lesser music, but it doesn't mean that they rightly know where it belongs. So now, the handout. On my page, I'm going to get this one around. That might be the answer. <coughs> Okay, what you have in front of
of you is the Our Savior Lutheran Church and School Children's Community Leader. Um, again, I, most of you already know what a current leader is, right? It's that kernel of song, the core, the core hymnody that a congregation or a church uses. Uh, I, I challenge you to go home and double check your current leader. Find out if you haven't done this in a while, it is a good exercise to do every three to five years. To not just assume you think you know which core hymn it is, but actually work the numbers. Look at what hymns you've sung over the last three to five years, track them, and find out what really is at the center of your congregation's hymn. Because you're going to want to know that as you start to plan what's in the center of your children's hymn. Because the center of our children's corn leader, golly, current leader is going to be smaller than our congregational current leader, um, but they need to match up. So that's my challenge to you. Go home, find out for sure what's on your congregation's list. Okay, this is the list that, um, with my pastors David Fleming and Jeremy Swam, we sort of distilled over the last 20 years. And I've broken it down into two main categories. The column on the left are the hymns based on the catechism, and the column on the right is the hymns based on the church here. But before we look at what these hymns actually are, I want to talk about the number of hymns. I think, I counted the other day, I think there are 42, it fluctuates every once in a while, so I, can't, I might be wrong. I think there are 42 hymns on this list. Many Lutheran um, schools and Sunday schools utilize, um, uh, they introduce hymns using sort of a hymn a week curriculum. Do you know what I'm talking about? So let's say the hymn of the week this week is Praise the One Who Breaks the Darkness. And they sing it for five days, and then they put it on a shelf, and next week you have a new hymn, and that's the new hymn. Um, so if you're doing that, you're going through 36 hymns in a school year. So this might be a point where you're starting to wonder what I'm talking about. If I'm saying, use a small number of hymns, but don't do that, because 36 hymns, but, right, 36 is less than 42 but it's the way that they're used is very different. In that sort of hymn a week, and I, let's not confuse this, I, I'm not talking about um, hymn of the day, that's a different animal, except it's not a different animal, it's the same. But I'm not talking about the hymn that's appointed to go with the lectionary readings. Um, because when, even if you're if you're on the three year, and even if that's, you, even if the hymn of the day is your hymn of the week, you're still, over the course of three years, dealing with what, 108 hymns in the school year, um, not 42. And many times, it's, those don't even line up. It's just random hymns that are being chosen. Um, we're on the one-year lectionary, so we could probably do that and have it be much closer to this. Um, and I've looked at the breakdown of how, how much that would change it. Most of the hymns that we encounter during the school year are already on our current leader, not because I chose them from the one-year lectionary appointed hymn of the days, but just because that's the core hymn of the church, um, and that's what we're using. So. Um, I got off script and now I have to find where I am. Sorry about that. Okay, so I'll find it, I promise. Or maybe not. Um, oh, okay, so the main difference is we're not putting these on the shelf, right? It's not 108 hymns, one week, five days on don't come back to it for another year. These hymns we sing over and over for weeks on end, and we sing them every single year. This is just a part of what life sounds like at our Savior. Whether you come to visit us tomorrow, or you come next year, or you come in the spring, or you come five years ago, or you come five years from now, this is what we sound like. Um, so what happens at the beginning of our school year is that we we follow the catechism like many Lutheran schools, right? We start with the Ten Commandments, then we make our way through the six chief parts of the catechism. So for the first ten weeks-ish of the school year, we are dealing with these are the Holy Ten Commands and the Ten and the Ten Commandments. And we sing Luther's these are the Holy Ten Commandments, right? Every morning when we gather to school. Not all 12 stanzas. We sing the first stanza and stanzas 11 and 12, which are a summary of why we have the commandments. And then we insert whatever stanza belongs with the commandment that we're studying for the week. Um, we sing it every morning, 
They sing it every day when they come to me in music. They sing it in their classrooms. We sing it in matches. Uh, we have a new fifth and sixth grade teacher this year, and he was the other day trying to calculate up, <laughs> trying to calculate how many times the children had sung that melody in just you know like the first eight weeks of school, and he just stopped five minutes, stopped trying. I mean, hundreds and hundreds of times they have sung that melody, and um, the stand and the text for one, eleven, and twelve, hundreds and hundreds of times as well. Yeah, and, and I think John can't die. We just. Um, so we do that, and um, then when we move on to the creed, we do the same exact thing with we all believe in one true God. You know, that's more like six weeks, but we're isolating the stanzas, we're singing them all of the time. Taking these small chunks of large hymns and repeating the same hymn for weeks on end helps the students to learn the text and the melody inside and out. Um, I have another handout about our catechism hymns uh, for you. This is a, a sequence, basically, that I put together several years ago. I sort of look at it very loosely now because it just happens. I don't have to be as structured about it. Um, so on this chart, oh, actually, can I? And he went for myself. Um, did you get one? Um, so uh, the catechism hymns, the six chief catechism hymns that we use are Luther's six chief catechism hymns. Um, and you can see those are the ones on in bold on your left hand column here. And then each hymn has its own little chart um, on this sheet. What this means, how this chart works, is that when a box becomes shaded, that's the year in which I introduce that stanza of the hymn for the purpose of memorization. Now, they're hearing, when they're in kindergarten, they're singing all of the stanzas corporately when we are praying together in Matins. But in music class, this is when I isolate just these stanzas, dig deep into what they say, and really work to have them memorized. Um, because we have combined grades, you'll notice that I only introduce stanzas in um, odd number of grades because, you know, first and second grade are together. So in second grade, they've already been introduced to it. It's just a review year. And so they always have at least two years of that deep dive before another one is, is learned by heart. And so then the goal is that by eighth grade, Everything's been introduced for the very specific purpose of having it learned by heart. Now, this chart, like I said, I put together years and years ago and have tweaked it from time to time. But largely, it just happens now. This is just because we have this sort of autopilot catechism thing happening. By eighth grade, they're all singing all the stuff. Um, now, some of them they don't know quite as well. You can see this in the chart, right? They're, they don't know stanza 10 quite as well as they know one or one, right, is the other ones, because we haven't worked as hard as long on them, but they're all there. Uh, this year, we're taking this program up a notch starting next month. We're starting a brand new program, so I shouldn't probably even talk about it until I know whether it works or not, but I'm going to tell you. Um, I was sort of been looking at like the Royal School of Royal School, I always get this wrong. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I see it. Yes. Um, and this lovely like award, not award system, but right, you can earn all of these sort of like merits along the way and, and they can display them. It's something for the children to work towards with the goal. And I wanted to have something sort of like that for our children. And we decided the best use of that energy would be here. So what we are going to begin doing next month is recognizing when the children have learned by heart an entire catechism. So they will have the opportunity to set a time where they meet with me and, and another adult of their choosing. So it might be their parents, it might be their classroom teacher, it might be our pastor, um, it might just be a family friend, someone they're very comfortable with. And they'll sit down with us and they'll have a chance to sing all 12 stanzas. And if they can sing all 12 stanzas by heart, then the award system that we've come up with 
Um, many of you have probably seen the uh, ornaments from Ad Crucem. They're Christmas tree, I mean, they're ornaments, right? They're designed for Christmas tree, but they can be happy anywhere. Um, they're circular in fashion, and they have all sorts of Christological depictions. Um, many of those were designed by a member of our congregation, Ed Riojas, and so we're choosing the designs that Ed um, did that are based on the six chief parts. So if they get all 12 stanzas, of these are the Holy Ten Commands, they're going to earn an ornament that has the Ten Commandments symbol on it. When they sing, we, are, we all believe in one true God, then they get this beautiful Trinitarian ornament. And they can get the whole collection of six, you know, by the time. And, and there's no, and they don't, um, there's no, like, schedule. You know, they don't have to wait to eighth grade. I know I'm going to have, as soon as we, as soon as this starts next year, uh, or the next month, I'm going to have probably third and fourth graders are the ones who are like, yes, yeah, bring it, in, you know. They're, they're the ones who really want to do it. Um, and, and they still have them fresh. And they're not going to be embarrassed. Not if they're older kids are really embarrassed by them. This is just who they are. But um, So I'm very excited about this. Ask me next year when it works. Or maybe don't. If I'm like walking around like this, don't ask me. <laughs> so is it just for that one? For the, these yeah. other whole, you're going to do it for each of them? We're going to do it for all six. And I, I've i decided, and I may regret this. We'll see. Again, I don't know how it's all going to play out. Um, that They can do them at any time. Like, just because we... I, I'm not introducing it until next month because I wanted to make sure we had at least one month of living with this yeah. hymn um, before we do it. Uh, my guess is what's actually going to happen is we're going to have a bunch of kids step in to do We All Believe in What You Got right off the bat um, because they, they all know they know. <laughs> um, and I think that sort of incentive then will get them going. So they can, they can tackle them in any order they want and they can tackle them at any age they want. Um, and then we'll just, it's just going to be a matter of record keeping for us, you know, who has earned these, who hasn't earned these. And, um, and I'm all about second chances. If you try it and you don't earn it, try again. Yeah. And I got all the time in the world to listen to you sing my catechism. Bring it. I'm, all, I'm here all day. Um, so that that's our new program. We're going to see how it goes. I'm excited about it. Okay, now I have to find my place again. Okay, oh, all right. On the back side of your sheet, this is not in the title. This is bonus material. Um, I'm starting, this core hymnody has worked so well for us. I really want to expand this into a core psalmody that we use as well. And again, this has sort of been happening organically, and now I've just brought out the pesticides and we're going to make it happen uh, intentionally. Uh, so we have always associated. Uh, Psalm 119 with Ten Commandments, 143 with Decree, 118 with Lord's Prayer, 121 with Baptism, 130 with Confession and Absolution, and 116 with Lord's Supper. So as we're making our way through the Catechism, we're using those psalms in our mountain services over and over again. And it's typically the fifth through eighth graders who lead the psalms, so they're rehearsing them and they're singing them in mountains. And typically by eighth grade, they pretty much have those psalms on by heart. So we're just making that more intentional as well. And then adding additional seasonal psalms um, and other psalms uh, to that list. So the number is the psalm that I think that we need to have. And then sort of in shorthand, I'm telling you what musical setting we use. Not that I think that you have to stick to one musical setting of the psalm and stay to it for an entire time. I, but there is definite benefit to setting a really good base level of a high quality musical setting with one of the songs. Um, and if you want to say later, hey, want to try out this weird setting of 130? They're like, okay, but also can we go back to seeing the Anglican? Um, so <laughs> they adore, oh, they love TLH 665 so, or 664 so much. Um, so those are, those are kind of my, right, this is just shorthand. Like this is what I what we're doing, and this is a work in progress kind of as well, forming this course on uh, So we'll see how that goes. With all these things you can ask me about next year and that I may not want to talk about. Um, we'll see. Uh, so at the same time they're singing the catechism hymns, we're also singing the corresponding hymns of the church year. So the right hand column of the sheet. Um, so at the beginning of the school year, we're singing Lord Keep Us Steadfast and Father Most Holy pretty much every time we meet for matins. 
Um, I started teaching preschool music for our school a year before COVID. So pretty much at this point, because we're introducing him to him even earlier, by the time um, our preschoolers are in kindergarten, they walk in with all three stanzas of Lord Keep Us Steadfast, already learned by heart. They have all the opening versicles of Matins learned by heart, which is really great because on that first day of school, when all of a sudden you're a big kindergartner and no longer a preschooler, and you've got to go to actual chapel where there's an actual altar and actual pastor investments, and, and you don't have a hymnal because you can't read yet, the very first thing they sing is, Lord, keep us steadfast in your word, and they're ready for it. And they know, oh, Lord, open my lips, mouth, will declare your praise. So the very first thing that happens on the very first day of school is something they already have in place. Um, and that they are hearing these eighth graders sing just as confidently and beautifully as they're singing. So that's how we start. And then we work through um, the list, which I think, is in numerical order? No, it's in church order. Good. Um, which is almost the same thing, but not exactly. Um, what you'll notice if you look carefully at that list is that typically there are two hymns per season. And I've chosen those um, very carefully. I typically choose one that is sort of the narrative of the season that tells the story of what's happening in Christ's life during that season of the church year. So on this list, that would be like Savior of the Nations Come, the narrative. From heaven above to earth I come. Um, the star proclaims the king is here, telling all of those epiphany stories. Um, Christ, the life of all the living. They're having these really strong images and narrative quality to the text. And then I've chosen another hymn, which I always call the doctrinal hymn, which is a lame way to, I don't know what else to call it but it just talks about more of the theological themes of the season. Um, and, you know, those narrative hymns are an instant connection uh, with, especially the younger set, that clear storyline, concrete pictures, um, the events of Christ's life. But all the while, those children are also still singing, learning, and taking on the theological truths, which may appear more abstract in form and language, but when they're repeatedly tied to the other hymns and to the season and to the word of God from the church year, they're fully grounded. So as the children grow and change, they grow into these hymns, and their understanding of them just deepens and deepens as the years go on. So how do you know when a hymn has finally made it into your current leader? You can't just type it on a sheet and say it's there. Um, I mean, that is a place, to, that is actually a really good place to start. Type it on a sheet, say it's your current leader, make yourself sing it. Um, I always assume that all of these belong on our list because for pretty much every hymn on that list, I think if you asked our children when they learned it, they would just think they'd always learn it. That's kind of how you know. Um, every year I take my choir down to the Fort Wayne Seminary to sing for a chapel service. And it's always like, well, now it shifts around. It used to always be the second week in January, which is the worst possible, right? You know, Christmas, 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 Christmas. Go home and open presents and don't get enough sleep. Come back. And guess what? Next week we're going on a trip. We have to see the Christmas chocolate, but it's great. Um, so I'm very careful about what I program for that. It has to be something I know we can pull off with very little rehearsal. Um, and one year, Cantor Hildebrand uh, asked if we could please sing stanza one if we all believe in, in one true God. <laughs> I think he even said, because the seminarians really need to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> this was a long time ago. <laughs> and I was like, sure. So we got up to the loft and we just started singing it a cappella, and Hannah pulled a brand and was like, uh, uh, how long have you been working on that hymn? Like, He's discovered that we don't rehearse for this. <laughs> and the children, my horror, said nothing, just blank faces. I was like, this is the worst moment of my career. Okay, and then, and then he reworded it, and he said, when did you learn that hymn? And then finally one great child said, we've always known it. <laughs> and it's true, right? This is their son's confession. They've been singing, we've 
wants to but this is who they are and who they sing. And so they don't know anything to do. <coughs> Um, the repetitive, daily, weekly, yearly singing of these hymns becomes the most powerful instructor, but that does not give us off the hook. There is much work to be done to present the core hymnody in a way that sings beauty and love and not rhythm. Um, in the Reformation 2021 issue of Logia, Philip Mangus, missionary for the LCMS, and Cantor at Village, um, Village Lutheran, Village, Missouri, makes an argument for the purposeful return to the core hymnody, not just in individual congregations, but synodically, beginning with our seminaries. It's a fascinating article. I highly encourage you to read it. Um, what he and I are suggesting is essentially the same thing, but beginning on opposite ends. He's calling for a tighter, smaller, intentionally Lutheran set of hymns to be taught to our future pastors. And I'm calling for the same thing, probably even pretty much the same list of hymns, but taught to our children. Imagine the impact if we start applying a point to both places. And this is good for the church. But the reason I bring up his article, other than the attitude or ever growing reading list, is because he gives a simple, clear method by which we can start this important work. Repeat attractively. Here's Bill on the subject. Yet getting people to memorize something today is not an easy task. Between the zeitgeist disdain for rote learning and the shallows of internet connected minds, people are not nearly as disposed or apt to take something to heart as they used to be. Here, music can again be of great service to the gospel, as it still provides a winsome path to memory. Only two elements are needed, attractive performance and repetition. Likewise, congregations need to present our hymnody in attractive ways, hiring skilled musicians if needed. Then they need to commit to repeating good hymns until the people take them to heart. That this simple formula, repeat attractively, appears to be a radical proposal goes to show how far we have sunk into the sea of resources in which we now need to swim. Yet, having a core group of songs that people know by heart is the norm for many Christians throughout history and still is the norm in many cultures. Thus far, Bill. Repeat attractively. It sounds pretty easy, although there are some pitfalls I'd like to address as we seek to follow Bill's concise advice. Repeat. Repeat, and repeat, and then just when you get so uncomfortable with the repetition that you think it's actually hurting the cause instead of helping it, when you feel super awkward about singing the hymn one more time, push through the awkward. Sing the hymn. The real love and growth in him typically comes right after the point where you think it might be time to give up. Keep going. Then, maybe put it away for a little bit. Because when you pull it back out again, what typically happens is that it is received like an old friend that has been deeply missed. But that's only going to happen if you live with it long enough to be guilty. Repeat attractively. Now, that word attractively is a bit of a subjective conundrum. And I can't even fully begin to unpack it, although do, I do think this is our good work, is to unpack what it means to be attractive in the way we design music. Um, but I will offer this illustration that I often use when I'm having internal debates over what is attractive and what is distracting. The illustration was first drawn for me by the contour Richard Fresh. He said, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the most priceless beautiful jewel in our possession. And it has to be displayed. Jewels are useless if they are not set. It then becomes the role of the church musician to select and craft a crown worthy of holding the jewel. The setting must be materials of great value so as not to pull attention away from the gem because of baseness or ugliness. Let's not scotch tape 
the jewel to a Burger King crown. But also, the setting must not be so ornate, so self-aggrandizing, that it overwhelms the stone, making the glimmers of true light, or masking the glimmers of true light shining from within. To repeat attractively is a balancing act in which we are constantly engaged. Personally, that balancing act is one of my very favorite parts of the job, but we must always continue to ask ourselves where we are on that balance. So what does repeating attractively look like for us and our Savior? Well, I've already outlined a lot about the repetition, the morning prayer, mountains, classrooms, but I want to talk a little bit more about what happens in my music classes specifically. Um, I meet with the students twice a week. Our classes always begin with a school-wide study of art and classical music that we do not only in my class, but in all of their individual classrooms as well. We have this, here's the place where I love the thing a week, right? We'll have a three-year cycle. We have a piece of artwork that we study together as a school, and we have a piece of classical music that we study together as a school. And we have 36 weeks and then three years, right? So we have all of these. And we talk about all of those at the beginning of my class. And then when that is finished, oh, and the artwork is everything from, you know, like, I mean, from Durer, Prince, to Picasso, and the art, and the music's everything from Hal Strudel to Stravinsky. Right? This is not all sacred, this is the music of our, of our heritage. Um, but then when that is over, then we launch into singing position, and we do our daily recitation, which is to recite our catechism, our scripture verse um, of the week, and if you are going to my other session or have been to it, you know that sometimes that means we're singing a setting um, of that Bible verse as well. And then we sing the catechetical stanzas that I talked about. And this is where we really dive in to the unpacking of the hymn, where we study the vocabulary, and we clean up the musical phrases that can get sloppy. Because when you sing a hymn hundreds and hundreds of times, you can get real sloppy real quick. So that's where we have to take the time to make sure that we keep things clean. Um, and we look at how Luther's words in the hymns compare with Luther's words in the catechism. We spend focused time memorizing, just testing ourselves to see how we have it memorized. And then often the attractiveness of a repetition comes from choral settings of the hymns on the list. So if you, where did I put, is it on the back of the list? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay, so this is, again, my shorthand, just sort of like off the top of my head, these are the ones I go to on a frequent basis. Um, I've collected just every possible unison and two-part setting I can of these hymns so that we have that attractive element. So I'm not bored of the hymns, so they're not bored of the hymns. So we have that repetition that we desire. Um, if you know more arrangements of these are the Holy Ten Commands, send them my way. Um, I only have two that I wrote, and they're fine, but I need more. Um, but these are some of the things that we do. I also take a lot of organ music, organ repertoire for the children on the campus premise and play alternate accompaniments with what they're doing. Um, and, and let the music then, I talked about this yesterday as well, but let the music be an exegetical tool that helps you understand um, what's going on in the text. Some of these, which one is it? Oh, the Ron, is the Ron Nelson, our father, um, that has it lead us not into temptation. It's such great text painting. The kids totally get it. Um, so these are just some of some of the things that we use to make it more attractive. If you have questions about what all my crazy initials mean, CJR is you. CJR is me. Right. So if it says CJR, it's something I pulled together. Um, yeah. Uh, CPHMS is the music subscription service. Okay. Yeah, some of these things may be out of print. I didn't tell you where to find the organ preludes. Just do your best. <laughs> no, um, if you have questions, please, please, please email me. It's on here. I will do my best to uh, clarify what that's all about. Um, and then we move, after we've done our catechism, we move into first steps in music or conversational soul fetish, depending on the age levels. Um, if you want to know about more about those, any extra person, she can tell you all the wonderful things about them. I'm going to say this, the reason that I love them deeply is not only because they're just incredibly well put together ways of teaching musicianship and music literacy, uh, but because they have a, a beautiful amount of flexibility that allows me to use sacred music and hymnody to teach literacy, to teach music, musicality. 
So they work really well with what we're already doing. And then if, so if we haven't already then used those things to transfer into our hymn of the day, then, or I mean our hymns of the season, and that's when we begin to work on those and our songs, and doing the same thing, deep diving into the text, understanding what's going on, cleaning up our musical phrases, um, and putting together all sorts of easy choral settings. Um, someone was asking me about what our music classes are like, and um, basically every class I teach ends up being like a choir rehearsal. There, there's very little like this is general music, this is choir. It's everything bleeds together. It's just how we do it. So that's how we handle then um, the the stand or the hymns for the season. Um, but I also want the children to then learn and know the joys of singing in SATV um, and the familiar liturgies and the core hymns. They are, you know, are the perfect place to start this project. It's not always harmonically pleasing to have or satisfying to have children singing just the soprano and alto part without a tenor and bass, but we do it anyway. I, I, that's where I start teaching that. And we don't do it so that we can um, you know, perform a stanza of it that way in chapel or in church or anything like that. We do it so that they can then go into chapel services where their pastors and their male teachers are singing bass parts and they can have that full experience of, of what it is to sing in four part harmony. Um, so we start that with our core hymns and with the liturgies as well. And then if I have boys whose voices have changed, I mean most of the time it's just me and they sing up high. And now <laughs> this is my favorite thing of the whole year. We have our new fifth and sixth grade teacher is Nathan Grimm. You know Nathan Grimm, son of Dr. Grimm, right? Um the road that I was trying to find him up. Um, and uh, and Nathan sings in his head voice all the time when he's with the children. And it's like, yes, it's so good because I can point to this wonderful male example of that. And then when he does sing in his beautiful adult male voice, they have that also then to hear and model. So then I have a couple um, seventh and eighth grade boys this year that I'm just placing me with him in chapel so that when they're singing, they know what they're listening for, what octave they're. You're shooting for. So it's very helpful to be able to utilize the people around you for your good. Um, so that's on part Um We're going to be running out of time. Yeah, we're running out of time. We're done, right? No? No, no. 15 minutes. 15 minutes? Oh, well, <laughs> shoot. Keep going. It says we're going to be running out of time very soon. <laughs> <laughs> <Poor old cats. laughs> um, uh, this is the second time I've given this presentation. When I gave it this summer at a different conference, I did only have a 45 minute slot, so this is true then. Uh, so I'm prepared to run out of time, but I'm also willing to talk about all these things to answer all your questions. Preschool repertoire. Yeah, so, uh, I didn't talk about it. I just put it on the list because I'm, yep, go for it. Ninth? Okay, 957 is in Luther's hymn. It's that. Uh, it's the uh, change. Uh, change. Uh, okay. When I saw that time. initially, I thought that was Luther's. It's, it's no, just no, the no, prayer no. itself. It's just the prayer. Okay. And, and uh, we just, I sing it to them at the beginning of um, the year. This is how we end every preschool music class. I say, oh, it's time to go. Everybody line up. They line up. Everybody fold your hands and say, I'm going to pray our closing prayer. And when I get to the end of our closing prayer, your really important part is to sing, Amen. And then I sing 957 to them. And at the end, I go, Amen. And then sometimes we do it again. <laughs> so, right? Do they um, sing along eventually? They start singing along very quickly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They can't stand it not. In like 594, do you just isolate a couple stanzas? Um, all, okay, so all? this is uh, for many of these are on that list because of the Gloria books that exist okay. to go with them. So I spend a lot of time singing these books to the children. Um, and again, even, even more than with the older children, the preschoolers could sing the same thing all year long, all year, yes. ever get tired. You could sing God's Own Child to them and have, let them read that book every day and be super happy. Um, and so uh, so I use the Chloria books to introduce Lord Keep Us Steadfast, God's Own Child, a come up from Emmanuel, and write so much fun. 
because Ed Rios is one of our members. So I can say, like, hey, you know Mr. Rios from church? He drew this. Um, it's great. Um, Angels We've Heard on High is on the list simply because they always sing the glorious. They always have. It's just there. Um, I Am Jesus' Little Lamb, again, Gloria. Um, then the On You Stay in the Lord Have Mercy, we actually, I have them on February. We, I do both of those much earlier at this point. This is kind of outdated. I didn't bother really changing it. Um, Lord have mercy, we pray almost every time we're together. And we put simple sign language with it. It's just one of the prayers to pray with them in preschool. And then, yeah, then glory be to Jesus and Christ the Lord is Jesus. So, and the song Jesus. So that's, and um, you might notice that from these lists, I have not listed any parts of the liturgy as being our core. And that's, because it's our core, right? I, don't, I mean, it could, I could write it on here. It could make everybody feel better, right? Um, <laughs> But we, we do the liturgy um, and spend a lot of time learning young, young praise, the, the offices, um, the divine services. We don't spend all that much time learning. I mean, I do with the little, with the preschoolers. But in our school system, um, the children who come to church come to church and know it's, and the children who are reformed, because if they're not Lutheran in our church or in our school, they're probably Christian reformed. Uh, just picked it up by osmosis, I guess. I don't know. They know it too. I don't know. Um, but I don't spend the time with time teaching that. Other questions? So in chapel, are you singing We All Believe in One True God every time? Or? Yeah. I mean, when we, well, oh, uh, every time we, every time we're doing a creedal section, during, during yes. a creed, but um, we speak, we still speak the Apostles' Creed together. We do sing. Um, we do sing the Lord's Prayer 957 as a school every morning together, so we don't have to teach that anymore. Um, so we just started doing that, I guess, last year. Um, for some reason, singing the Lord's Prayer was just not a big thing that we had done ever really at our Savior. And so I think like five years ago, I was like, this is ridiculous. We've got to start doing this. So I started teaching it um, to the kids. But up until that point, we have been using, you know the Dura play, Lord's Prayer? It's, it's so beautiful. And there's a unison choir setting of it. I write this down in my note. <laughs> there's a unison setting of the Dura play, Lord's Prayer, and it's beautiful. And that is what I used to use as the way my choir closed every rehearsal. But uh, it has a lot of similarities in structure, which is no big surprise, to 957. So when we started learning 957, I had to put the Dura Flow away because it was just messing with everybody's heads. And so I put the Dura Flow away, and then COVID hit, and I forgot to take it out. And so I took it out last week for choir rehearsal, and I handed it to my fifth grade grade, like my top choir that I think knows everything. It's like, oh, guys, look, I brought this back out. And they had no idea what it was. I was just, oh, gosh. But we're fixing it, right? We're going to, we're going to. Pull it back. We'll pull it away. And stuff like that happens with this list, which is why it's important for me to have it written down and to like yearly make an appointment with myself to go over it and make sure that I still believe in the things that are on this list and, and stand behind them. Um, we didn't really talk about like how I made the choices, but I think you can probably discover just by looking over them if the text is Lutheran. It stands a good chance of being there. If it is not, it is probably not on. Um, the older it is, probably the better shot it has of being on my list too. I, there is there is wisdom there, right? This is right again. We look at the phone to find out what day it is. Well, it's it's, yeah. found, it's foundational. <laughs> it's foundational because right. because if they know this stuff, they can pick up a start. Oh, of course, yeah, absolutely. They, yeah, absolutely. We had a little girl in our school. She referred to the order of matins as the order of maintenance. That's right. I never correct her because I don't know it's kind of true. That's kind of true. The order of maintenance. It's lovely. I love it. It's so good. Yeah. Uh, we use we use matins. Um, and then just uh, uh, right before COVID, we taught them morning prayer. We had never used morning prayer. Um, and I was against it. I was just flat out. I don't mind telling people when I'm wrong about things. I was so wrong about this. I was like, no, we're just going to keep using maps. We just need to stick with one one office for these children. 
They don't need to be confused by the same words, but with a different melody. And, and uh, my pastor convinced me to give it a shot, and I begrudgingly did. And they love my prayer. And there's, there's, they don't have any trouble traversing the different translations of the two texts. Um, they see the parallels, but they also don't stumble over them the way this old person does. Um, so we use Matins the majority of the year, and then we'll switch up in morning prayer sometime in the winter. And so what, what we do, we don't do the Matins on Wednesday, um, except during Advent and Lent, and then we do what we call Standing Matins. Maybe it's a better name. I don't know what that name is going to be. But obviously, during that month, we stand instead of sit, and it's very truncated. So we're in and out of mountains in 20 minutes. Um, so when we're doing daily mountains during the penitential seasons, then when we have seated mountains on Wednesdays, it's actually morning prayer. Like, we need to fix so many words. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how to. But we also call it chapel. And what? It's in a gym, and it's mountains. So let's, I don't know. We, we just have, we have some word problems. You know how... Every institution has that. You call something a thing, and then you realize it's not actually that thing, and you want to change it. But if you change it, there are all these other problems that come with it. So, yeah. So, those are some of our problems. Can I tell you more about our problems? <laughs> <laughs> um, yes. Do you have a similar, um, like, verse introduction structure for all of these hymns, or just for that? Just for that. Just for the catechetical ones that I want to be incredibly intentional about making sure they have. Like, if they're not going to learn, Anything else on the sheet by heart, those six, I want them to ask them. So, so yeah, I've never seen this one. You have a separate chapel for school. So, no. But it's on my desperate desire list. Um, our preschool director is not a member of our congregation. And so that brings with it just a few extra obstacles that we're, we're working through. Um, we have, she got these unbelievably huge grants this year. Like, I think it totals the state, 60, the state, grant. the state grant for preschools. She got like $60,000. Just, uh, here's a check. We don't we're, we don't care how you spend it. These, these were COVID-related. COVID-related. Yeah. And, I mean, as long as it was for preschool-related things, um, so I got like every puppet I've ever, ever dreamt of. Yes. So <laughs> wonderful. Um, but then also, we are uh, commissioning a woodworker in our congregation to build um, a child-sized altar for their room so that, so that we do have a place where we can do that, so that they have a place. Otherwise, we have chapel in our gym, and we have an altar on wheels, which sounds worse than it is. It's actually, yeah, it's not bad. It's fine. I mean, it rolls, but you can't see the wheels. Um, so, uh, so they don't ever get a chance to be in that space because it's just... It doesn't contact their schedules. But we are working them towards having an altar in place for them and a chance for them to have. And, and obviously, because we're learning the offices, they're getting cool parts of it. We're just slowly working our, our way up to that happening. Other questions? I was curious, during COVID, did you put your animals away, or did you keep teaching out of them? Like, um, we're just getting back to that. So in our school, Every child has their own hymnal. Um, they get it in first grade. I always say, if you want children to take ownership of the hymns, you have to give them ownership of the hymns. Uh, so it's you know like when the when the parents write the big check for fees, you know like twenty five dollars is a hymnal fee. And I wish I would have brought one of my children's hymnals. They're ridiculous looking. So they. They get these hymnals in first grade, and the way we keep track of them is we just take Sharpie mark and write their name with a big on the end. So you can, you know, so it's so we don't have any trouble figuring out who left the hymnal in the hallway. Um, but then they they use these hymnals to death. They are, I mean, like at first people are like, well, what are we going to get our kids when they their confirmation if they already have their own hymnal? I'm like, well, trust me, they're going to need a new one for confirmation. I mean, they're they're terrible. My son's hymnal. But my son is a junior in high school now. His original hymnal is like exploding because he kept every single little like psalm handout I've ever gave them stuffed in there, and it's got post-it notes everywhere, and it's and he had like a, a book cover on it so he could stuff all the stuff in the. It's like padded. It weighs a thousand pounds. It's bigger than the altar book. It's terrible. <laughs> um, but uh, or, or they just fall apart like completely. One day, one of my kids was like, 
Uh, Mrs. Roberts, I don't have Psalm 27. I was like, no, Connor, trust me. I know Psalm 27 is one of them that's in the hymnal. They're not all in the hymnal, but I know Psalm 27. It's like, no, like my hymnal, <laughs> that section's missing. <laughs> so yeah, so they get really well used. So we didn't have to we didn't have to deal with that at school because they just already all had their own. So it's um, it's a worthy investment, and if you can get the parents to just add 25 extra dollars to your fees, it's it's pretty easy to make it happen. The biggest thing is simply, oh, is that my son? I love you! Thank you. He's a freshman here this year. So. <laughs> it's very exciting to be love here. Freshman. What? You can love freshmen. I can love him. <laughs> no, I love lots of freshmen. Um, high school and college. So, uh, yeah. Thank you all so much for Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.